Okay, thanks everybody for joining the Mr. Top Step Jump Quinto webinar. Um, as I tried to say a little bit earlier, um, it's going to be a really interesting webinar because you're going to get two perspectives here. You're going to get the old floor guy, the old floor hack me, and then you're going to get Jeff, uh, a very well-known educator who has run prop trading firms and some very, very big clearing firms, both at the Chicago Board of Trade and the Mercantile. And what we're going to try to do is we're, we're going to skip around a little bit. Uh, as you can see, Jeff put up Humpty Dumpty. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Jeff, give us a little background on yourself, and let's move it, move it forward. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Danny. And I apologize that, uh, um, that we had this little glitch. But you know what? The glitch is over. We'll get restarted here. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for taking your Saturday and joining us. And we're going to talk about Danny and I. Um, the first time I talk, just very briefly, Danny and I have known each other for over 20 years. He and I, I remember seeing him in the lobby and on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And we always got along um, beautifully. And I always respected Danny as an aggressive, good guy, one of the one of the good guys. And um, in any event, the uh, um, so he and I have been friends for a long time. We've seen each other in a lot of different and uh, um, all, all sorts of different things that we've done. But we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about um, getting ready for a great fall. Now, when we use that term, getting ready for a great fall, probably some of you have thought this is what we were talking about. And I should tell you right now, this is not what we're talking about. This is, in fact, what a great fall looks like. Um, it does. Um, this is a great fall. Actually, the center picture is near where I live. And it's what it looks like from the lake. And it's a it's a pretty good look in the fall. Actually, i got to say, it's a pretty good look all year. But the fact is, that's not what we're talking about. The fall we're talking about looks like this. And so it's quite different. It's also quite timely. And we'll get into Danny will explain why it's quite timely for those of you that, uh, um, that don't know. But it, it's, uh, this webinar, we planned it uh, you know, uh, weeks ago. And uh, we couldn't have planned it any better, although the little spike in the, uh, uh, in the electricity was uh, not perfect. But the fact is, our timing. Uh, other than that, has been absolutely glorious. So here we are. We're talking about uh, what kind of a fall, what kind of a great fall. The uh, yes, like Niagara Falls, it looks like, doesn't it? That's what we're going to talk about. And today we're going to, between Danny and I, we're going to talk. I'm going to talk about spikes, um, which we've just seen an example of a spike. <laughs> um, uh, we're going to talk about. Danny's going to talk about Friday's trade. He's going to talk about what it means and how you can take advantage of what may, may be coming. I'm going to talk a little bit about the VIX and about volatility. And Danny and I together are going to answer any questions that you might have. So without further ado, if everybody's ready, what do you say we get started? Spikes. Now, when you think of spikes, what do you think of? Is this what you think of? Well, maybe. Um, this is the picture. This is not Danny. I want you to know that, that, that this is not a younger picture of Danny. He did not look like this. He did not give me this picture. This is somebody completely different. So if, for those of you that thought that it might have been Danny in a younger age, since I know Danny from a younger age, um, I can tell you that it wasn't the Danny that I know. <laughs> um, so we're not talking about this kind of spike. What kind of spike are we talking about? And what I'd like to do is tell you about action in the gold market and as an example here. And so here we have just kind of a normal day. This is from a year ago in the gold market. We're cooking along support and resistance. You can see it. It's kind of looks sideways, right? Not much happening, not much excitement. There we go. We're just kind of taking it all for granted. And then, uh-oh, do we see that bar? Where's that from? The market spikes down. It comes right back on the same bar. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what everybody on the floor would be saying. I was 10 years on the floor. Um, when something like that happens and when it's against people, they're going, oh, that's a mistake. It's just an error. Something's wrong. And they come up with all kinds of excuses why it doesn't mean anything. And sure enough, the market very often comes along, and it, it seems to prove them right. Because look at these bars now. OK, it did this big spike down, but now it's kind of working its way up. It's still kind of holding the support that it had previously. So it must be some sort of a mistake or something that happened. And that's what people do. They kind of take a breath. They go, you know what, this, is, this isn't anything. It's just, it just was a, a fluke. It was just something odd that happened. It doesn't mean anything. Um, then the market goes on, it kind of drifts lower here. Well, wait a minute, gosh, did that tell us anything? Well, it's not really tanked like it did on the spike, but does it mean anything? And then here's how it ends. Of course, it ends much lower. Um, what's my point in this? Um, I believe that spikes are meaningful. Actually, I believe that every market price is meaningful. And the fact is, when the market's able to spike lower or, or 
go higher. Usually it's a spike lower, however. Uh, when the market spikes lower, it, it indicates weakness. It gives us a, preview, a potential preview of weakness. Now, the fact of the matter is that the market's not so simple that it doesn't work every time in exactly the same way. So this is all about probabilities, which you and I know trading is all about probabilities. And so what I'm telling you is the probability is when the market spikes like that, that it's uncovered weakness. Because where were all the people that were willing to buy gold at those lower prices? In other words, even though it happened quickly, how come people didn't have resting orders in there? They wanted it so bad, they thought, gosh, if I could just have it, I'll buy 100 here, I'll buy another 100. Where were the people that were wanting to own it? And so what happens, is, what a spike reveals, is it reveals weakness. And so the fact of the matter is that what this did, this is not a mistake. When I was on the floor, when the market would close out of line, everybody would be screaming, ah, oh, it's closing out of line, it wasn't there, it wasn't there, it shouldn't have been there. And it would close, let's say, particularly on a Friday, it would close, let's say, out of line, and everybody go, we'll be back on Monday. Well, Monday, it would start where it closed on Friday, actually. In other words, the, the, the out of line close wasn't out of line at all. It was just showing you what was coming. And that's what I think spikes mostly do. So I'd like to very briefly tell you about the biggest spike I was ever in the middle of. And it was when I was in the proprietary trading business. And uh, I came in one morning in the proprietary trading business. I should tell you also, for those of you that don't know, um, that with a partner, I owned a proprietary trading business that had offices in Chicago and Vienna, Austria. And it was my job to train the traders um, and to manage the risk. And so I came in one morning about 7 o'clock. I looked at a... Uh, I looked at my risk watcher, we called it. It was on my screen and it had all the traders and had how much money they were up or down and what their positions were. And I looked at it. Of course, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. We traded Eurex, so we had guys that were, that were trading from the European morning. So they were trading from 1 o'clock in the morning in Chicago on. And we had the guys in Vienna that were trading, of course, from 9 o'clock in their morning on. So we've got some activity. We're up maybe $3,500, something like that. It was sort of a nice, normal morning, you know, kind of a good way to come to work. You're up $3,500. And the day, our, big, our big day, which would be the U.S. morning, Hadn't even started yet. So in any event, I'm looking at this, and we're up 3,500. I see that one of our guys has got a nice little position on in uh, uh, the Dow Jones Euro Stocks 50. We call them the F stocks. And um, um, so in any event, I look at uh, um, I look at that, and um, I kind of think that's cool. Got a good start of the day. I look away uh, to get a drink of coffee, and I look back, and we're down something like $7,000. And I don't know how this, how this happened. When something like that happens to me, it probably is the same way for you. What happens is you, you, you don't believe your eyes. You like think you must have looked wrong. So you sort of blink and look again. And then you wonder, well, did you look at it wrong before? Because it always been like that. But luckily for me, um, uh, I, not luckily, I should say, but, but it very quickly, now we're down 12,000. And now we're down like 15. And it, it, start, it start losing one. Look at the screen. It's all in one guy's position. And the one guy was a, was a trader by the name of Jeremy. And he had like 27 um, F stocks on, Dow Jones Euro Stocks 50. And so I look at it. We're down like this point. We're down like $20,000, um, which is a lot of money for us. And I run out of the, my office into the trading room. And I look at this Jeremy. And he's like white as a sheet. And he's staring at his screen. And the market is just falling, falling, falling. And somebody yells, watch the DAX. And so Jeremy's also got a chart of the DAX on one of his screens. And we look at the DAX. The DAX is just a red line down. It's just, it's just remarkable what it is. And so we watch the DAX go down. We're just, we're almost as quickly as we're watching it, it starts to come back. And it comes back just as fast as it, as it went. It, at, the, at the most, when the DAX was down at the bottom, we as a firm were down like $220,000 on this open position, which wasn't even that big an open position. And that, was, that would have been... The, the biggest losing day we had would have been eight times bigger than the second biggest losing day had we had we gotten out there. Well, it came back so fast, and so Jeremy, Jeremy and I agreed that when it got anywhere near where he got in, he was going to get out and flatten the position. But it's coming back so fast, um, you know, we, we, we thought we were going to be okay. Well, in any event, the next thing that happens is Jeremy makes the smartest trade of his career, and the smartest trade of his career was this. He, he, got, he, was, he had bought it up here. The market went way, way down. The market starts coming up. And what does he do? Does he wait for it to get here to get out? No. The smartest trade he ever did was when it, got, when it just approximated that, when it sort of got close, he got out. And the, the, there's several parts of this story. One part I want to tell you about is that I've seen so much money lost when people have a price and they demand that the market comes to that price and gets them out. In other words, I'll get out. I'll just scratch the trade. I'll get out at even. Well, how, how many times does the market come up to you almost come up and then it tanks again. 
and you didn't get out. And now you got this thing on that you know is horrible. So Jeremy did the smartest trade, which was he got out of the he got out of it, and he got he got to trade again. He got out of it, and as luck would have it, it went up and it almost got to him, and then it tanked again, and it went lower all day. That Urex actually ended up closing the market shortly after this story. They closed the market for the rest of the day because it was such a fiasco. Um, and so, what actually happened? Well, by the time it was said and done, what actually happened was this: there are these two knuckleheads in. Uh, Frankfurt working for a bank, a bank that a name I can't recall, but it was somebody I'd never heard of, but it was a clearing bank, and a, a, um, and these two guys were in some room somewhere trading on the simulator. And the one guy looks at the other and he says, you know, I think this DAX is going lower. I'm going to sell some on the simulator and see how it works. And so he's got the simulator going, so he sells 50 on the simulator. And the market goes lower, and they're laughing at each other. Look at this, the market's going lower. Boy, did I, did I pick it. It's too bad it isn't real money. And so he sells another 50, and the market goes lower. And they're like chuckling it up. They think this is the funniest thing they've ever seen. And then the guy starts selling 50 and 50 and 100 like that. And the market's tanking, tanking, tanking. All this on the simulator, they're just, they're just laughing hysterically. Laughing hysterically, I should tell you, until the door bursts open, and some guy comes in, their boss comes in, presumably, and he goes, what are you guys doing? And they look at him. Nothing. We're just, we're just trading on the simulator. Look at this DAX is falling like mad. We're just trading on the simulator. Can you believe we caught it on the simulator? And he goes, you idiots. <laughs> that was a live market. You sold it in the live market. And so these, these, these guys sold it in the live market. Well, by the time it was over, according to the Wall Street Journal, as I recall, this bank, which uh, I would tell you the name, but I can't remember it, but it's not something that I had heard of at least, uh, it cost them 7 or $8 million in order to unwind the, the trouble that these two guys uh, uh, made. And I'm sure that their, their careers at this bank came to a sudden and abrupt ending, that, it, probably that exact moment. Um, so in any event, that's my story of spikes. So I think that any place the market goes, um, it's telling you something. We just know how to, have to know how to interpret it. And we also have to know that these are probabilities. The market does things in probabilities. So I'm not saying that every spike will, will tell you a story. But you know what? They mostly do. And that's all we're trying to lead with this. So um, anyway, that's my story of spikes. And as you'll see, my, my, I think I'm accurate in saying yikes about that particular one. Um, uh, Danny, could you tell us a little bit about the non-farms payroll? Hey, Jeff. Um, on Friday, I should yeah, say. Thank you. That was a great story. Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of problems, and it, as everybody knows, um, you know, in the old days when we did things, um, I open outcry, we would have an error in the pit. But now, when you have an, and and we could prevent that kind of stuff um, at a certain point. If I told the guys in the pit to sell 500 big S and P's, and I meant to buy 500, I could scream to them and say out. You know, and stop filling the order. I got to go the other way. And um, with electronic trading and what we do on our trading desk, sometimes we execute for you know twelve, twenty billion dollar hedge funds. And when they sell us, tell us to sell twenty five hundred or a thousand or ten thousand, and we actually do those kind of numbers off the desk, you can't stop that. Once once you hit the button, you're you're done. But anyways, let, let me jump into what happened on Friday. And I think this has got, you know, it was Jeff's call to talk about spikes. And we all know that the S&P has had an enormous spike. In fact, it's had a 15 or 14 and a half week spike. And we've, I've seen a lot of this stuff over the years. And one of the things that brings me back most recently is when Marty Schwartz had a, a really, really big crude oil position on last summer and crude oil options position and we got a big spike and he had made over five years I, I, I will get into why he moved to crude options on another point but he he had he had been consistently trading and making money over five years anyway he had he had made 30 or 35 million dollars trading crude options and then late last summer and into August as remember crude oil had that big spike over a two-day period, he, he had made thirty million or thirty-three million, and over a two-day, two or three-day period, when Bow spiked, he lost thirteen million in one and two, one or two days. And then he exactly what Jeff was talking about, and this was not prepared. I don't even think Jeff knew about that I was going to talk about this, but he he called me up and he said, "Danny, I don't know what I'm going to do." He goes, "Look at the Bow and crude," and you know what he was doing is he was trading futures 
around his core option position and losing millions of dollars on the vow and the vow spike, but he was also getting chopped up on futures. Well, I didn't have a lot to say to him. Um, oh, his size was huge. I mean, 30,000 crude options on for himself, okay? And, um, and what he does is he boxes these positions in. He'll be long at 90 and he'll be short at 110 or 120. If the, if the crude oil gets up to 102, 103, he starts rolling higher. And then if crude oil goes down, he starts rolling down. And then what he does is he's caught in the middle of it and he doesn't want to do the rolling stuff, he'll buy five, 600 crude futures. Very, very bad thing, okay? So spikes are real. But anyways, I'll kind of quicken this up a little bit. What happened is he had lost 13 million in a two-day period, and his family was giving him a lot of problems, and things were coming over the phone on me really hard. And he said, what do I do? And I said, Marty, I said, here's what you've taught me. If the market gets back up near your price where you can get out, get out. Just get out. Don't, don't hold this thing anymore. He had, he, had 30, he had 40 million in his trading account at, at, at Vision Futures, and we, we, it's an account that we brought in, so there's a lot of risk here. And uh, about three or four days later, he was trading 20 to 30,000 crude options on futures a day. I swear to God, this was going on. His commission checks to the people at Vision were three quarters of a million dollars a month, or a million dollars a month while this was going on. So you can imagine how much he was trading. But what happened was, he got back up, he got the thing back up, the, the money came back up to 12 million. And he called me on that day and, I, and, he, and he said, what do I do, what do I do? And he's depended on me this for many, many years. And I said, Marty, I said, you were out of your mind the last couple of days. If you can, if, if, if you lost 13 million and you can get out right now, well, yeah, Marty lost control. And if you can get out right now, and take a million dollar hit, you've made 12, you took, made 12 million back, you're only a million off your high, get the hell out right now. He did it. And you know what happened? Over the next two weeks, he lost $25 million. And that's exactly what Jeff was talking about. Get out. We're, we're, not, here to, we're not here to be geniuses, we're here to make money. We're here to get in, we're here to get out, we're not here to put our asses on the line. And that old story about trying to get even, Forget about it. Sometimes you will. Sometimes the markets will go your way. And Marty has said before, hey, once the market starts going your way, you should hold on to it. But you know what? Marty's got $100 million. And I don't know how many people in the room right now have that kind of capital to hold on. Capital preservation. Right. 100% KB. All right. So here we go. We're going to hit the, the unemployment. I went, down, I went down to the floor yesterday because it... it we had a situation back many years ago where the unemployment number came out on a Friday and the market ducked lower. And we actually had an error where we underbought 200 big S&Ps and on that open, on that Monday, it picked up $800,000. And we had to give that trade to the, we, back then we would have to offer the winning trade to the client and the client took it. So we remember this day particularly well. Okay, so here we go on this slide. As you know, Mr. Topstep has an instant message group, and we, go, we do it from the trading floor. And what we do is we've got several uh, educators. Uh, and what we do is we go online. And, and this is me. I got, I got on the floor at about 7 o'clock. And what you can't see right now is I was talking to a guy by the name of Jason Carter at our desk. Um, and I wanted to know what trade I could do other than selling futures that we could put on and, and for, for potentially an upside or a downside shot. And you'll see how this all goes. And it's, it's, these are actual captions from our instant message. And I sent them to Jeff, and Jeff put them up for me. But anyways, while we were sitting at the desk, we were talking about the endo April 1350 put, okay? And this was at 7.02 or 7.03 in the morning, right but 28 minutes before the number. And the put was trading 720, 730, 750 before the number. And I think we, we could have bought those electronically on Globex. But anyways, after the number came out, those puts doubled in price. 
Now, this is me talking to my, there's about 50 or 60 people online in the morning, even though it's a holiday. This is me talking to the group. I'm not sure what you guys are thinking, but my gut's telling me we could be in for an upset. I don't know. Where do I get that? I, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not a genius. No, J, you know, J.P. Morgan or Goldman didn't call me. 729, look at the bid offer and the mini. The, I, I saw the, the, the mini the mini bid offer just just went to hell. I mean, it, it went from five, 600 up to about 50 to 150 up. And I was like, what, what's up with that? You know, I mean, well, I know that there's not a lot of people online. And obviously, we know the credit crisis. We know what MF Global did. Volumes are a lot lower than they used to be. And for me, that's a big thing. But, you know, some people don't think it is. I think it's a gigantic thing. Seven, 732. Oops. Kind of thought that was going to happen. That's me talking to my guys on uh, kind of talking to me. Marty Schwartz, yes, he's been. I've been working with Marty my whole career, and and a lot of this stuff Marty helped me learn. But a lot of this stuff is just straight from the floor. Okay, these are things that we've learned that, you know, I mean, not not so much this, but this is just. I don't really follow charts like, like a lot of you guys do. I follow price action, and the fact that the cash market was closed on Friday had me feeling that anything could happen, and the potential for the market to gap up was probably there, but. The potential for a collapse was even more there. Um, do you do you trade your gut feeling? Yes, absolutely, I do. Um, but then here we go. Well, you know, I, I because I did this program trading business for UBS, I knew that there was no cash market open, and I knew that there was a lot of stops under the market. And when that starts going, um, when that starts going and there's no liquidity, the algorithms take over. Now remember, program trading's out. The, you can't do program trading when the cash market's closed. But you can, you know, what you can, what you see here is basically I hit this thing right on the head. And um, when I say Brian and I have seen this act before, this was about the eight hundred thousand dollars we should have made on the open that we had to give the client. And then around seven fifty after the S and P had traded down to seventy two, I mean. It was just the algorithms were having a party, and um, and they did, and that really that really was what it was. And when we talk about this, um, we're going to talk. You know, one of the things that sticks out to me is prior to the open, we track Lobex volumes every day. Okay, and the last three or four days, we've had about two hundred. No, we've had about three hundred eighty to three hundred ninety thousand minis. Traded Globex before the open. You know how many? You know how many minis were traded before the before the number thirty five thousand. So we go from Thursday to doing three hundred ninety thousand minis before the open to doing thirty five thousand before the unemployment number, and that's what you get. And if you're going to tell me that you don't think that algorithm trading doesn't have a lot to do with that, I don't know what does. Now, the, and, and here, I'm not the greatest of a chart reader, but when you look at, when I look at the chart, I look at the red line, the first drop going down, I'm like, okay, now you know that, the, now that you know that that gap has created that enormous, uh, enormous selling that was going through the mini at the time. But then the, the, then the little stutter step, boom, line, line down, line up, line down, line up, line. this, this is a, this is a perfect example of algorithm trading chasing stops. That's what that is, okay? And that, and now, for anybody that tried to buy that lower open, you you got you got railroaded. I mean, and, and a lot of guys did. And we we were online, and people were trying to buy it. Where do you enter on something like that? You don't. You know what? I, it, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna BS you guys. There are many many great traders say that you're not supposed to, you're supposed to trade up to the event. You don't trade the event. If you got lucky and you sold the S and P right before that, you're 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 the million dollar man. If you ended up being one of those poor souls that bought them, you're out. You, you, you know, that's the biggest move all year in the S&P. And it all happened in less than a minute. So, you know, is this the kind of risk you want to take? I, I love, yeah, it's a 50-50 chance. I love it. But I would have, but had we been on it, I would have bought those puts and I wouldn't have had to worry about risking a ton of money had the, had the futures gone down like that because 
there's no way you could have got stopped out until that first bar came to a low. And then, so anybody that had sell stops in there got filled on the low. All right, well, let's, let's go to the next slide. All right. Now, this, this, is, this is part of Mr. Top Stop. And, and these, these trading rules are on the website, and they're some of the most sought after. We, we've had a lot of people come to us and tell us that these are great. You know, this comes right from the floor. This, this has got a lot to do with the way we see the price action on the market. Now, this particular trading rule is called Counter Trend Friday. Now, we didn't have 600,000 minis trade or anything like that, okay? So part of the rule is not going to completely apply. But from years and years of being on the trading floor, I believe, and this is my rule, that Fridays tend to be counter trend days, okay? So going into it, I had that in the back of my mind, okay? Now, of course, we didn't have the four to 600,000 minis trade, but that said, the rule in itself is to fade the strength in the morning if the market starts, you know, um, in front of, and the, 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 this rule particularly works well on an unemployment day. And I guess I got to back it up. We did not get the volume, but typically we got the price action that we were looking for with this rule. Okay, and these rules um, you can find them at MrTopStep.com and go under education, and they're right there. We're going to have an ebook that we're going to be offering everybody. And I'm telling you, this is the stuff that Marty Schwartz and I used to work together on. This is the stuff that I developed when I was on the floor doing the UBS program trading business. And this kind of stuff, I know that it may not fit into your trading toolbox right now, but some of the rules that we have in there, like the 10 handle rule, I mean this, the 10 handle rule has become one of the most, most famous S&P rules out there. We believe that the S&P moves in 10 handle increments, and it does. Watch your, watch your ranges. Right, you know, what, what, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to, it's not just about the, the peaks and the valleys and all that, but we're trying to give you a little bit of ammo, the, the things that we use to help us make up our trading decisions. I'm going to pop over here. Let's look at what we got going here next. But this is a great rule, you guys. Uh, and I'm telling you, it's worked for years. And uh, now we're going to let uh, let my partner take over from here. Okay, thank you, Danny. The uh, uh, this this all fits together so beautifully with the market action, doesn't it? I mean, we like I say, we planned this weeks ago, but it seems like we planned well. Let's talk about the VIX, and I'm talking about the VIX here um, as how I use the VIX, and so I'm not talking about the VIX as if uh, the you know I'm wanting I'm suggesting that you trade it um, every day or whatever. I'm, I'm just talking about the VIX over a longer period, and what I want you to do is look at this chart, and what I've what I've done is I've marked uh, the, a line at 30 on the VIX and 20 on the VIX. And because I think the VIX generally describes the kind of volatility that we are in. And so let's look at this. And you can see that the VIX is sort of rotating around um, about 20, maybe a little higher. Um, somebody told me once that the VIX has a mean reverts to 19. Um, I, I, maybe so. It looks to me like it actually maybe would mean revert a little higher than that. But uh, uh, be that as it may, let's talk about this. And so. What I'd like to show you here is kind of areas, and, and I, my way of using the VIX is to, is to just be aware of where the VIX is, number one, and because it can help us describe um, where it is, the market is, in terms of volatility. So here you have, as you can see, I've drawn a line that, uh, um, uh, that goes from like 1992 to 1998 or something like that. The VIX is under, is under 20. When the VIX is under 20, it's going to have a certain personality. That is, the markets are going to have a certain personality. And that personality that the market's going to have is it's going to be slow trade, not much volatility. And you can see here the whole time from about 1992 uh, to about 1998, it's, it's under 20. It's kind of just cooking along there, not very exciting. And then comes 1998, and you remember the tech bubble and all the things happening in the late 90s. And you can see that it, that it actually... The low of the VIX throughout the, uh, the, the late 90s and the early 00s um, was actually 20, and it spiked up above 30. Um, I would contend that, that what we really want in volatility is we want steady volatility. And so here in this period from, say, 1998, 1999 through 2004, that's exactly what we have. We have volatility as measured by the VIX. 
of between 20 and 30. It's just kind of it was a it was a beautiful time to trade. Lots of participants in the market, and people that traded generally did well. And they thought they also thought, as we all do, that it was going to last forever. And uh, that isn't that wasn't to be. Because in 2004, as you'll see, the VIX went below 20. And I remember traders that we had. I think I already told you that I was in the proprietary trading business, and we were doing quite well um, in S and P's and ES um, in those days. And when when the VIX when the volatility went out of the market in 2004, 2005, guys were telling me that you cannot trade the S and P when the VIX is below 20. And sure enough, here the VIX was steadily below 20 between 10 and 20 for the whole of 2004 through about 2007. And those people figured out how to trade because the market had this steady volatility and there's a certain way that you would trade given this level of volatility as measured by the VIX. And then along comes 2008. And we'll all remember 2008 because that's, uh, that's going to be a marker, I predict, for um, how we're going to feel um, how we're going to feel about volatility? We're going to go back. You'll be you'll be telling your grandchildren about um, oh, uh, 2008, and you can see how the market spikes. So the market goes along now for the whole time that we've been um, since 2008. It's essentially other than a few uh, a few times, it's been below above 20, and during the height of 2008, it actually went up to 60, and that's a pretty. Uh, um, it's a pretty amazing thing. And then today, of course, we're in the in the high teens, and we're probably after the spike. I didn't look at it on Friday, but uh, um, we're probably above that. But the point of it is that we're in this very volatile area where it goes from this is this is to me kind of one of the hardest um, times to trade because you have volatility that'll be at 20, and then it'll be at 30, and it's it's it wildly vacillating between the high teens and the high 20s, and it makes it hard to trade. So that's what we're, I just wanted to give you an idea of that. So my idea on the VIX is that you should be aware of the VIX and use it as a marker to tell you what kind of volatility the market has. Um, now we're talking about 2008 and I said you know we're going to be telling our grandchildren about 2008 as being the, the wild time in our trading experience. However, Danny and I know about another time that was slightly different. And so we're looking at the VIX at, at 60 in 2008. Wow, and could it ever get any higher than that? Um, you know, is it even possible? Remember how wild that was, how wild 2008 was, all the things happening in the fall of 2008. You just couldn't, you'd, you'd, you'd be looking at the news over the weekend, you go, oh my God, yet another thing has happened. You know, the world is indeed falling apart. And, uh, um, but could it ever be more volatile than 60? Was that ever be possible? And let's look at the answer to that. Here we are, 1987. Now, Danny and I remember 1987. We are we are ancient. Well, at least I'm ancient. Danny's not quite as ancient. But the fact of the matter is, we well remember 1987. The VIX in 1987 uh, topped out something over 160. So it was well over double what it was in 2008. And so. The fact of the matter is it can get more. And that's kind of one of the themes I wanted to leave us off. We're going to take some questions here in a second. What I wanted to leave us off with, whatever level of volatility you think it can't be more volatile than that, um, I'm here to tell you that, yes, it can. I don't know what the limit of volatility is, but in my experience, it's always more than what people think. And uh, um, I point this out as 1987. I know it was a long time ago. It seems like ancient history, but history has a way of repeating itself. And I'm not saying that 1987 will come again at some point in, in the near future or even in our lifetimes, but I'm just saying that we need to be aware that it's possible. And anytime people say, well, this will never happen, the market will never do this, I just run through my mind, oh, yes, it will. We just don't know when. So um, in any event, that's how I look at the VIX. I would use it for the purposes that we talked about. And now, look at this. We've got a couple of gurus here, Danny and me, and we're, we're welcome to take any uh, sort of... Uh, uh, that's a picture, another picture of Danny. How did I find these pictures of Danny? Um, in any event, um, I'd like to take any picture, any picture, any uh, any questions as would Danny. So we'll just kind of talk about for a few minutes here. We have a few minutes we can do this. Um, and uh, anything that we can do. Um, okay. Okay, well, you know, let me... I'm not I'm not a pro on the VIX, um, but a lot of people do say that the VIX is a lot different than it used to be, and there's a lot of reason for that. Um, there's 
there's all sorts of trading going on in there that did wasn't going on in there years ago. Professional traders have gone into the VIX now. There's algorithmic trading going on in the VIX now. Um, it's it's not just being used as a hedge anymore by the, the the big hedge funds and stuff, or people that want to lock up you know some risk against their stock using the VIX. It's being used by it's, I, Jeff. You probably know about this as well as I do. How many different areas are using the VIX now? Um, yeah, they, there are people that use it. My, my purpose in using it is not as a trading vehicle, but just as a marker for how the market is. So, uh, slightly different, I think. Um, yeah, now, the, one of the things that uh, somebody said that I, I, I forgot to mention, I meant to mention, um, everybody should know that we are about to have a European holiday on Monday that doesn't, that for us in America, for those of you that are here that are Americans, um, you don't know, but it's Easter Monday. So that's going to add a complication to this whole brew that we've got going, and that is that it's a, it's a holiday in Europe. And there's two such holidays, there's two European holidays that you need to be aware of that we don't have in the United States that always catch us a bit flat-footed. One is, of course, Easter Monday, and the second one is May Day. And May Day is a big holiday in Europe. Um, we don't know it in the United States, um, but it is a big holiday. So it's, it's a, uh, um, we need to be aware that part of the market will not be in play um, in the, starting this Monday. Let's, let's, let's ask, let, let me look at the, the Apple question. Um, do you guys watch the news on Apple? Is Apple 5% of the S&P? Yeah, we do. Uh, we watch Apple a ton down in the S&P. Um, it, you know, I was talking to Marty Schwartz about this last week, and it's a very, very good question. And the reason it's a good question is because definitely Apple has become a bellwether of the S&P. Um, and unlike you know, back many years ago when Marty was on the trading floor of the Amex, uh, uh, IBM was the bellwether back then, and there's been other bellwethers along the way, but uh, definitely the weighting of what's going on with Apple right now and the, the, the big look that it's getting, um, it's, it's predominant right now. We, we look at two or three things on the board. We look at the euro currency, we look at crude oil, and we look at, we look at Apple. We're in the S and P. About more about H. Um, well, go ahead, Jeff. You have you want to answer one of those in there? I was going to talk um, um, a little bit about spikes and so. So, I'm, my, my purpose in talking about spikes and in using spikes is as a is a marker that the market is going to they're, they're meaningful I think that every price the market does is meaningful so in terms of trading them no they, they come out of nowhere and so I'm, I wouldn't be trading them I don't know how you would how you would anyway um, I certainly don't believe in trading numbers I think it's a it's a uh, it's a crapshoot when I was in the proprietary trading business um, we didn't allow our traders to trade the numbers and so what would happen would be that I would go out in the trading room right before the 7.30 number, 7.30 Chicago time, that is, um, when the biggest numbers are. And I'd go out there and I'd be talking to the traders. At least in part, my purpose was to keep them, make sure that they're not trading and so that they knew that I was there watching. So they wouldn't be all, uh, they wouldn't uh, trade when we didn't allow them to. And as, I'm, as we're waiting for the 7.30 number one day, one of the traders who had recently traded in Ireland, of all places, at a, at a, a, a proprietary shop, um, the, the room was quiet, and he says, well, you know, I saw a guy make $200,000 in a minute and a half uh, on a number once. Well, everybody in the trading room like looks at him. I mean, that's something you want to know the answer to, right? What, what's the story of somebody making $200,000 in 90 seconds? And so we look at him. He goes, yeah, he traded the numbers. This guy was a big trader. He traded the numbers. And it was on an unemployment, and the market spiked up on the, on the initial announcement of it. He sold the spike, and then, the, then the, they had a chance to digest the number. By the time they digested the number, the market, the market plummeted. He bought it down below. A matter of 90 seconds, he made $200,000. And everybody in the trading was going, wow, wow, can you imagine making so much money in this? And so we're all going like this, and, and so I'm thinking, well, that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I'd like to make, like make $200,000 in 90 seconds. I'd be good with that. 
Um, uh, but I don't know how you would do it. So I, I, I said to the guy, I said, okay, well, tell me. So this guy traded numbers all the time? He says, yeah, yeah, they traded numbers all the time. This guy was the king of numbers. And I said, well, is he still doing it? And he goes, no, no, he blew out. He's just, he's long gone. He blew out. I'm like, really? Okay, well, how good a story is that? And I said, well, does the firm still allow their traders to trade numbers? He goes, no, no, the firm's gone. So the point is that, that trading these numbers gives you bragging rights for all sorts, of, all sorts of cool stuff. But in terms of making a living, I don't think it's happening. And so I stay away from, I stay away from numbers. And spikes, I think, come out of nowhere. And i got to stop in. And if it stops me out, if I'm in the wrong side, they get stopped out. So I do. Um, and... Uh, one more thing, you know, somebody asked that we said we were going to talk about the Great Fall, and Danny and I agreed we were going to talk a little bit about risk management, which we have not addressed. Um, to me, the way you handle if this market turns into a big deal, one way or another, and we said a Great Fall just because it was a, you know, it was a topic for he and I to talk about. We didn't know the spike was coming. Um, we would just have that as a topic. Um, it could be a great, it could be a great rise. When if the market should become incredibly volatile, um, you have to have your risk management in order. And the fact, of the, the fact of the matter is people typically don't. Uh, people think that everything's going to stay the same, and it doesn't. Things come out of nowhere. These spikes come. The reason I don't think you can trade them is because they come out of nowhere. And you don't know what it's going to do next. And so I believe you have to have a firm grasp of your risk management. And by that I mean how much are you willing to lose on each trade? How much are you willing to lose each day, each week, and each month? That's the downside. But that is just half of it. The other half is how are you going to take advantage of the market when it rewards you. And this, believe it or not, is the most important thing. So the most important thing for you to do is to have plans in place so as the market rewards you, you accept the reward. I tell people in my professional trader mentoring program, we spend as much time on this as we do on anything else that we do, and that is that when the market's giving you money, you want to be in a position to accept the money the market wants to give you. When the market is taking your money, you want it to take away as little as possible. But if the market's, if you're winning, you want to take more. So if we should have a dramatic, if the market should go from where it is now to being um, dramatic, you need to you need to be in a position to to cut your losses if you're wrong, but accept importantly the gains if you're right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, you know, if if it's okay, I'm going to go back on some of your questions real quick. Okay, Mickey, I think I answered your question about what we look at from the trading floor. And then, Gary, you're asking about Sunday night. If the market was to open higher, would that be bearish? Well, I, I think it would be. Um, first of all, according to the uh, Trader's Almanac, the Monday after a good Friday when the exchange is closed, I think the NASDAQ is down an average of like 0.75%, and the S&P is down like 0.60%. So I, I have a pretty strong feeling that the markets will be lower. Now, how do you how do you attack that after a big slide like that on um, on on Friday with the market closed? I don't know, but I, I agree with I, I agree that you know there's going to be a little bit of a catch up process on Monday when the rest of the world sees what happened there, and there'll probably be some additional selling that will go in on them. But then again, if you look at our trading rules, one of our trading rules is mutual fund Monday. And that's when the mutual funds put money to work. Now, we're not sure how that's going to play out, but I think Sunday night you're going to see some weakness right off the bat. That, that's, that's my gut feel. And then, Jeff, uh, Jeff, do you trade spikes? You know, we, we, we do. We, we call it, um, in the S&P, we call it buy the dips and sell the rips. Um, now, Jeff is talking about, I think, a lot of larger spikes, like the, 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 the gold chart that he was showing and the S&P. On Friday, those are those are spikes. Okay, um, we trade them, and I, I actually in the in, in the old S and P for before electronic trading, I used to love to trade it like this. But um, we'll get to this. Will fall into kind of Jeff's question. Um, you want to talk more about program trading and algorithmic trading? This is what I do. This is what I've done my whole life. Um, I handled all the program trading business for the Union Bank of Switzerland. Um, we actually clear um, a bunch of algorithmic HF, HFT program tra trading traders at uh, Vision, and you know there there's something to be said about this. And I don't want to say that it's not trading. I don't take everything that Marty Schwartz says for granted. He says it's not trading, um, 
you know, and when it goes back to what he does for a living, it's not. Um, but at the same time, this is the way people make money, and it does it does account for a good seventy or eighty percent of the market, the volume in the marketplace right now. So it, it doesn't matter who you are, what trading, what kind of trading you're do, doing. Everybody has to adapt to algorithmic and program trading. Now, I was on a radio show on Friday, um, and I gave out a little hint. And I, if you guys want to tr sign up for the trial of our chat room, I would suggest it. I really would. But when I went on, went on a radio show on Friday, and I, I can't get into this in full bore right now, but I can help you understand how program trading works in the S&P. One, you have to have the ability to have the S&P cash on your... The way I do it is I've got... I've got my e-mini board. I've got my e-mini ladder, right? I, my where it's trading last, and then I've got my S&P cash sitting right next to it. Okay, and what you've got to learn is you've got to learn what fair value is. You can this is not that hard to do, and I can train you on this, or I can teach you about this. But it will take a little bit more than me jumping on this and doing it over a small amount of uh, you know a small amount of time. But you take your fair value, um, the S&P, and you can get that every morning. And a dollar below fair value is where those bids are going to be coming. So in other words, if the S&P is weak and, and the, and the S&P cash is trading a, a dollar, full dollar below, a handle below, where the, if the, if the, if the, if the futures are trading at a discount, let me, let me re-say this. If the futures are trading at a discount of a minus a dollar to fair value, that's where they're bidding for sell programs. And when they're bidding for sell programs, they're buying futures and selling cash, okay? That's how it works. If the, if the S&P is a dollar over fair value, the way they do buy programs in the S&P is they offer the futures and they buy the cash. You can understand how those spreads work, okay? Now, algorithmic trading is a whole different thing. We grew up with the guy, and, and Jeff knows him too. His name's uh, Steve Schuler. And I'll be honest, Steve Schiller runs a, what, the largest uh, uh, you know, algorithmic trading firm in the United States. It's called Gecko. And I'm, I, he's, a, he's a billionaire, and, and, there's, and I, I'm happy for him. But to tell you the truth, Steve didn't know, he didn't know anything about trading. He used to stand over my shoulder, pounding the phone down on the desk all day long because he was losing money in S&Ps, but today, He's the largest program algorithmic trader in the world. So, you know, it, it, there's a lot to be said about what we do for a living, but, you know, we're up against a real lot right now. And when it comes into the program area, the HFT area, what I've learned, and if I can share anything with you guys, it's not to go in there with your six gun, your all your bullets ready to fire at 8.30 in the morning. Algorithmic trading sends all this different, they send all these little blips and, false starts that we see throughout the day. And what I've learned is that you just got to let the market, you know, get into a little bit of a groove before you jump in there because there could be a program that could be running your way and you don't even know it. Another thing that you could look at for when you're trying to determine program trading is that they tend to do these programs on a half hour. So, you know, you, you wouldn't see it right off the open, but if you see a buy program at 9 o'clock in the morning, you see a buy program at 9.30 in the morning, you know, and you'll be able to determine that by looking at your highs and lows of your cash. But if you follow those, those programs on the half hour and they do them at 9 o'clock, do them at 9.30, do them at 10, more than likely, there's probably more of that to go on throughout the day. Now, again, it's, I, I'm not sure if that helps you, but there are little things that you can do throughout the day as traders that are not all that technical in nature that you can follow and will help you follow program trading. Now, let's see. Russ R. Yeah, let me try. Let me try one, Danny. Could, could I uh, um, on the uh, uh, on the high frequency trading? Um, the fact is that it's as Danny said, it's some sixty to eighty percent of all trade comes from this algorithmic high frequency trading. And so, the question is, does that uh, does that hurt us or help us, or what does it do? And I think what it does is it changes the market. It changes the complexion of the market. It's my belief that the market is always changing. I I like to think of it as always evolving. So the market is evolving. It's what it's supposed to do. What we're supposed to do as traders is we're supposed to evolve with it. 
And what people do is they think that everything is going to stay the same, and it isn't. The market is always evolving forward. So what do the high-frequency traders do? Well, they give us great liquidity at the bid and the offer. It also means that if you're thinking of buying the bid and selling the offer, which is what I used to do in the late 90s and the early 00s, that's what people did. You, you buy the bid, you sell the offer, you look at it on a price ladder, and you're like, a, you're like an electronic scalper. Well, the market doesn't need electronic scalpers in the very, very small time frame. It doesn't. So that isn't, that isn't where the money is going to be for us. So what it does is it puts us back. It puts us back one step from that, and it puts us at a slightly higher time frame where we have, where we have things to add to it. So my point in the higher frequency trading is that it's just the newest incantation in the market. It's a new thing. It's a great thing. It allows liquidity at the bid and the offer. But to my way of thinking about trading, it doesn't hurt us. Of course it doesn't hurt us because the fact of the matter is that it's just something. And whether it's hurt us or help us, we have to figure out how we're going to deal with it. So that's the point that I wanted to, uh, um, that I wanted to make. And then I, I should also tell you they did it on here, I'll, and then I'll, I'll be quiet for a minute. Thank you for putting up. That's my website, uh, Professional uh, Trader Mentoring. And I did three videos for the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange that you can see on there. And uh, um, I want to thank Danny for this uh, uh, for this wonderful opportunity. It's always fun, Danny, to, to be with you and to, uh, uh, to do this. It's a, it's a great honor. And uh, we get to, I, every time I look at you, I think of, of our passing each other on the floor of the Mercantile Exchange or in the lobby of the CME. And yep. here we are. Thanks a lot, Jeff. You know, um, if, if I can, I'm going to try to bang through a couple of these real questions real quick. It's, it's a Saturday morning. I'm sure we've all got a lot of stuff to do. And I'm, we can sit around and talk forever about this, I'm sure. And, I'm, and anytime Jeff wants to get back together and any of you folks want to do this, I'm happy to do it. Um, I, I think it's all part of learning. You know, look, there, there is no magic carpet out there right now, and I, I don't think Jeff or I or anybody else will tell you there is. Um, what I, I think what you're going to get from Jeff and I is we're not going to try to sell you anything that's going to cost you 3500 bucks, or we're not going to get, you know, give you promise you anything that you're going to turn around and wish you hadn't listened to or you bought, that's not who we are. Um, we've been doing this a long time, and when, when Jeff talks about program trading making up 70 or 80% of the, the volume, that's exactly what it did on the New York Stock Exchange last week. 80% of the New York Stock Exchange volume was with program trading. So you, you gotta learn, you've got to learn this stuff. Um, I, you know, maybe what we can do is we can have um, do a webinar specifically tailored to program trading to kind of help you guys understand it a little better. It's not that hard to learn, and a lot of this stuff is not that hard to learn, but it's made it hard to learn, and I think of what it requires is just, it's like what Marty Schwartz says, if you want to make the money, you got to do the work. But here, let me go back and answer a couple questions real quick. Um, KB, how much will the election play in the, in, into the market in November? There's the, the statistically, an incumbent always has a much better uh, chance of re-election. But and we all know that the election years are, are you know, are, are, there, there's favorable trade winds in election years. And the fact that the market was in its position where it was coming into this year, they definitely played, played out. That's definitely played out um, in the beginning of the year. I don't know, you know, I mean, the best guess that everybody's saying, it looks like, Obama's favored to win this election. I, we've tried to stay away from all that. That doesn't really, um, you know, who's going to win, who's going to lose. But yes, there have been some very, very big moves, KB, going in to the November election. And a couple of years back, I remember Marty and I had a big play that we did, um, and we set it up about a month before the election. And I think the S&P rallied about 80 handles over about a three-week period. So there is, there is a lot of value in that. Um, any value in learning um, the NQ on um, NQ? Are you talking about the Nasdaq Nasdaq Mini? You know, look, I, the, the, it's, the Nasdaq Mini has been a great trade this year. Um, it's like the S and P; it's gone straight up. It hasn't done much any, anything other than that, except that it's been down what six or seven out of the last eight days. So we are seeing a big adjustment here over there, and I think that the unemployment number we had a is, you know, I don't want to say that the markets are topping, that we're going to go crashing down, but with the, amount of, with the amount of upside that we've had over the last 14 weeks, 
you know, a pullback in the S and P is going to be more welcome than anything. And I think the sellers will jump all over it if it starts going down. Let me let me grab a couple here. Uh, Cuvée. Um, there's talk that money from bonds and cash is flowing into the stock market. Cuvée, yes, it, it's true, absolutely. If you remember last summer, there was a big reallocation. It was a multi-billion dollar allocation out of uh, out of stocks and into bonds. And it's, it's been on the tape and it's been everywhere, Bloomberg on CNBC, that that unwind has been part of what's been helping the stock market go up this year. It's very obvious. You know, people that went, that went into bonds for protection, they, they received zero for their money and, they're, and they're, they're, they're out of the game and they're seeing the stock market go up. So yes, there's been a gigantic asset allocation out of bonds and into stocks. It's been predominant and it's still going on as we talk. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else that I can answer for you guys? Uh, thank you. Outstanding. Okay. Um, S&P movement due to Friday's non-farm payroll limited to pending earnings. Now, that was, you know, look at the market was really, and I think Jeff will agree with this, the market's been up so much. You know, any kind of upset with the way they've been toting the job creation. Now, you know, I, I'm not the b biggest and uh, most studied guy I read, but they say that we need 360,000 jobs uh, cr created a month for an extended period of time. So we get, a, we get an uptick in some of this economic stuff. We see an uptick in, in some of the unemployment. You know, they get 270,000, they get 250, they get 230, they get 220, and then we get 120. That is not good. And the market reacted in kind of that. Yes, the earnings are going to start to come out next week, but you know what? I think the main thing about what we saw on Friday was that the market was overdone and looking for an upset, and it got it. Um, Jeff, really like your videos. Jeff, of course, Jeff's, as Jeff talked about, Jeff's, Jeff's one of the most well-respected educators on the CME. Okay? When, when I go into the CME's education department, it's Jeff's pictures that up there. That's up there. So, for any of you guys that are from my side that don't know Jeff, you should really zero into his uh, website and start talking to him. Um, talking about really, really, really good foundation here, and he knows so much about the market. You guys have good insights. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Okay. Well, you know, listen. Let's. You know, if it's okay, we're going to leave it like this. Jeff, is there anything more um, that you'd like to kind of add to it? I don't think so. This has been a, been a great uh, a great thing. Um, I appreciate this, Danny. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I don't think I have anything to add. I wish everybody a, a happy Easter and a uh, uh, wonderful week next week. And Danny, to you. To you too, Jeff. Thank you very much. And um, hey, everybody, I want to wish everybody a, a, a very nice Easter weekend. And, um, you know, there, there's more to learn about trading than just somebody coming out and talking about technicals. We have a lot of that in Mr. Top Step, and we're going to be doing a lot more of that in the future. But there's also a lot to be said about how the markets function and being around people that have been, and been around these big moves and kind of try to help explain how they work. So what we'll do, we'll leave it like that. Thank you, everybody. We're going to sign off, and uh, hope you have a great weekend. We hope to see you on the Mr. Top Step chat on Monday. Really, uh, you'll, you'll get a lot out of that, even if you're only there for a week. Jeff, thank you very much. And have a good weekend. Thank you, Danny. Okay. Same to you.